Hello, I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, host of Higher Education Today, a production of the University of the District of Columbia. Welcome back to the education program that connects you to contemporary issues, people, and institutions involved in the world of higher education. Today we'll be talking about poetry, English majors, and creative residential communities. Myra Scleru is Professor Emerita of Literature at American University. Myra is the author of nine books and former president of the artist community, Yado. Her poems are in the Contemporary Poets Archive at the Library of Congress. Ethelbert Miller is director of the African American Studies Resource Center at Howard University. Ethelbert is author of 11 books and is founder and former chair of the Humanities Council of Washington, DC. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks again for coming on. Uh, Myra, maybe if we could start with you. Why would someone study poetry or English in this era of iPhones and short clips? It's an important issue. Um, studying poetry and studying literature enables students to think about critical thinking, to think about um, creative process, and it relates to every field. Um, it relates to medicine and science research, and it relates to, to various other, other th fields. And Ethelbert, how would you answer that? I think it's critical. You know, um, I tell people that with the speed at which we sort of operate in this society right now, with everything's very, very fast, uh, poetry slows you down. Um, you can't read a poem just once and feel that you understand it. Um, you just can't look at a word and, and not grasp its full meaning. You can't even look at, at punctuation and not take it into consideration. So what I feel um, poetry does is almost like teaching people yoga and meditation. Slow down, learn how to breathe, read this poem, take it into you, really take it into you, and now see how it changes and transforms you. And I think there's a spiritual connection that is very important when we talk about people learning poetry, that it's not just all science and technology, it's the development of who you are as an individual. And may I add something to that? Ethelbert, um, talking about the spiritual side, um, David Fenza, who's the president of the Associated Writing Programs, uh, which is a, a, a college-based um, program, um, talks about the, the need for authenticity, that, that writers and, and those who look at poetry are looking for something that seems more authentic than, than much in our culture. So you're saying in your view that much of our culture is not authentic? Well, it's, it's fast moving and we're, we're in a revolution with the digital age and so we, we don't know quite where we are. We're learning the mechanics of it and we're using it, but, but uh, the, the, the time for, for reflection doesn't happen there. But this is, this is interesting what you're both saying because if I understand what's happening at a lot of universities, there's a lot of pressure to buy new high-tech equipment. There's a lot of pressure to move faster. And I hear you saying, well, it's time, it's time to be important and it's important to have time to reflect. Well, let's look at these universities and let's begin to look at who is running these universities. Let's look at the boards. Uh, many of our university boards are stacked with people coming out of the corporate world. Um, they're hired to keep the doors open at these institutions to raise money. So many times when they are sitting on the board having a, their, their little meetings, uh, they're not thinking about the humanities. You know, they're thinking about you know, um, research with a big R. Um, they're thinking about what they see being discussed in the newspapers, technology, science. And so that's where their focus is. If, if the school is in the news for those issues, as well as maybe the sports team, they're happy. If you're in the art department doing wonderful work, or you're in English writing wonderful poems, I don't think that comes up in, 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 in the budget hearings and discussions at, at the Board of Trustees. Well, that raises a fair question. Is, do you think that English majors should pay less in terms of tuition than computer science majors? You want me to answer that? <laughs> I think I, I'm, I'm an advocate of free education, <laughs> you know, so I remove the price tag off everything. But, it, well, assuming that that may not happen, <laughs> Uh, does it make sense to then say, well, uh, English majors should pay less or pay more? Well, you, you know, you could ask yourself, what do we want to invest in in terms of the future? Uh, right now, for example, one area that I would really emphasize would probably be philosophy. I think we need to produce young people who are able to deal with the big questions. You know, why are we here? You know, what's life? I think those are the issues that we really need to be concerned about in the future. Do you agree with that, Myra? I do. Um yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, in terms, in terms of the big questions, if I understand what you've both written, and I've read some of your stuff, it seems to me that the role of memory is something that keeps coming up. 
And maybe you could explain to me, if you don't mind sharing a little bit, what is the role of memory? What should the role of memory be uh, in poetry? Um, I think I'll tell a little story, if I may. When I first started teaching in 1970, my first students were Vietnam vets. Um, they were not rehabilitated. They were in serious psychological trouble and physical trouble. Um, I was teaching uh, Dante, the Dante's Inferno. Um, the student um, had, his behavior was unusual. He would stand in the back of the room, in the back of the hall, when we were waiting to go into class as if he needed an escape route. He was still quite fearful. When we studied the Dante, um, going into that underworld, into that dangerous underworld um, of, the, of the story of the Inferno, it enabled him to write about his experiences in Vietnam, uh, among which he had been lifted. Um, he was in a, a front group, and he had been lifted uh, out of a ring of fire into a helicopter and saved, and all his men had died around him. He'd never been able to talk about it or write about it. Um, and so th this enabled him to use the memory that had been sitting there um, that was traumatic and, and to find a home for it that was less traumatic. Um, and this is true now with the, the vets who are coming back from Iraq and from Afghanistan with these writing groups that seem to be very helpful to them, um, more so than some of the traditional medical treatment. Well, you know, along with memory, I, I think the other side of the equation is the, the imagination. You know, I yes. think that that's something that we should always encourage people in terms of trying to nurture that, on trying to imagine things that we don't even see. Um, I think when we deal with memory, you know, many times we're dealing with the past. I think the challenge we face in our society is what type of future are we going to inherit? And so to put people in, 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 in a room and say, okay, imagine this, or, or look at this painting, or, or, or listen to this music and imagine something, I think it has a lot, uh, especially for groups who have been uh, powerless, uh, especially for many of the um, new immigrants have come to the United States, you know, to be able to create something new. We, we know you've been separated from your homeland, but now imagine a new home. Well, but, but how can we do that in a way that broader communities understand? So, for instance, let's assume that you're right, Ethelbert, I think you are right, that there, that there are a number of recent immigrants who are separated from, their, uh, from wherever they came from, and their memories are different than the memory that somebody else has. So how can we incorporate that into poetry or writing that the broader community understands? Well, what we're talking about is, is one, um, creating new narratives. We're talking about is issues like synergy, bringing different parts, bringing different stories together and creating a, a, a better whole, or, or Barack Obama would say a more perfect union. I think this is what we're dealing with. The first level of this in terms of people interacting is developing degrees of tolerance and understanding. Uh, many times we see people from other countries and because they don't look like us, we don't want to hear their story or because they speak a different language, we feel their story is something incomprehensible. But I think this is where once you are dealing with universities, uh, higher education, what you're trying to do is create structures, create classroom situations in which young people arrive on your campus one way and are transformed after two or four years. But certainly certain people would argue that, well, who's doing the transforming and what are we transforming people to? And you could see that this could be a political issue. Oh, definitely. You know, now if I was a little Tea Party guy, I would have a certain perspective. Uh, you know, if I was on the progressive left, I'd have another perspective. I think what we're talking about here in the United States is finding a particular middle ground. You know, I think one of the things that is beautiful is disagreement, okay, and, and trying to work things out, learning how to listen uh, to people, and then also how, we, how do we build something. I think that's very important. And speaking of listening, uh, in terms of Yado, my understanding uh, is that Yaddo is uh, one of the most fascinating places on earth in terms of people getting together and, and being really creative. Uh, do you teach people to listen or do you assume that people know how to do that before they get there? We hope that they will relish the, the space and time and, and credence for what they're doing. And um, they're there as they are with many artist communities with composers and visual artists and cinematographers and choreographers. So they're, they're having this wonderful um, experience with the various arts. At the same time, um, they're absolutely left to work, which they have not been able to do probably in their whole lives. Um, and to, and, and they're, they're given the sense that what they do has some value. Um, they're, they're, they're fed and housed and given places to walk and to think some people, I remember Galway Connell saying, 
a wonderful American poet saying that he would just go there and read, and then he'd go home and write. But but just to have the, a couple of weeks or a month or two months to do to do the thing you love the most is very special. Yeah. I don't mean to be disrespectful, but why couldn't I just sit in an apartment or a house and, and, and reflect on my own? Why do I need a community like Yado or another artist community? Well, you're guaranteed that you won't be interrupted. When you're at home, you interrupt yourself. Uh, the phone rings. Uh, the, the bills have to be paid and, and the usual s stories of life the people looked after. So there, you're absolutely guaranteed that you won't be disturbed during the working day, or, and some people get into a rhythm where they work all night. Their, their tendency is to go back to the, the most fruitful hours of the day that, that work for them. And the staff there is remarkably sensitive to the needs of, of, the, of the artists who are in residence. And do people get a scholarship to go to Yaddo, or, or do they pay to go to Yaddo? How does that work? Um, as with most colonies and art and communities, um, people apply and a panel of peer judges uh, evaluates the work. At Yaddo, it's entirely free. Um, they are, everything they need is, is, is there for them, studio space, food, place to live and sleep, um, beautiful places to walk. Um, so basically, it's, it's entirely free for them, yeah. And Ethelbert, in terms of, I know you're involved in the Institute for Policy Studies here in Washington. Uh, which in some ways is, is a kind of think tank or a community. It is a think tank, right. Uh, yeah. how, do, how would you compare that to, let's say, one of the residential communities that, like Yaddo or one of the other communities? Oh, well, I, I, I think now uh, it is interesting because one of the things that we have at the Institute for Policy Studies is a partnership with the Split This Rock uh, Poetry Festival. Uh, if you go back and look at the beginning of the Institute for the, uh, uh, Policy Studies, you'll see that Dick Barnett and Mark Raskin, the founders, were people who were schooled in the arts. I mean, Mark Raskin's a phenomenal you know, piano player. Uh, um, and so the arts was always part of the, the beginnings of the IPS. What I've tried to do as, as board chair is, is, is to renew that commitment. Uh, I think we have a wonderful um, community there. Uh, of young activists uh, every summer when we have interns, sort of like when people at Yaddo as, as a residency, we have these interns coming from some of the major universities. Uh, and we know that during this summer that they're with us, their lives are going to be changed. You know, I look at my daughter, for example, she had an internship at IPS, and it definitely affected her, her, her outlook on, on um, issues affecting our country. Fair enough. In terms of the, the skeptical question, mm -hmm. Uh, and I'm sure you've heard this once or twice in your lives, where somebody says, well, that's is great, but how do you make a living? Um, do I want my son or daughter to major in poetry? Uh, what are you going to do with that? Can you open up a poetry store? Can you open up a philosophy store? What do you do? Yeah, well, my mother <laughs> said, what are you going to do with majoring in African American studies, which is what I majored in? Well, I tell people this, whatever you, you are studying, whatever you're learning in, in college, you have to do what you would do in terms of good business, and that is diversify your portfolio, be able to do a number of things. Um, I don't think, for example, if I was simply writing poetry, I would be paying my mortgage. You know, My ability to do other types of writing is very important. Uh, I tell young people, for example, who want to be writers, you know, be able to write for the screen, be able to write, you know, do journalism, you know, blog, I mean, um, not just do poetry. So that's just wise business thinking in terms of also career planning. And how would you answer that, Myra, in terms of your students at American? I'm sure once or twice you heard that question. Well, a lot of our students come to us from various professions. Some were, you know, uh, surgical technicians, some were, uh, they, they, they had various, some was a geologist. So they, they have these, they have a profession. And very often when they come to a program, they decide to change their profession. Um, one decided to go to Iraq and, and do some nursing, uh, sort of looking at the larger world in a different way. Um. <clears throat> Can you teach students to be more spiritual or be more theoretical in their poetry? Um, I, <coughs> excuse me, I never thought that you could teach someone <coughs> to be a poet, let's say, to, to, to write. You can teach them to read differently, <coughs> excuse me. And some people think that the, um, because literature got so, um, uh, how to put this, it, it became used as a tool to, to talk about different constituencies rather than to look and really see what was written. Um, some people think that the creative writers have, in a sense, restored the poetry and fiction to its original purpose, whatever that, that might be. 
Um, so I would say no. You can teach people to, to look closely both at their own lives, at their inner selves, at their curiosities. Um, you can help them to f find in their own work um, those key areas that are the thrust of the, their, their, their identities. Um, but you, you can't really teach someone to be a writer. I don't think so. Do you have a thought on that? Ethical? Well, you know, I, I meet writers almost every, every week. Um, there are some individuals I meet and they want to make money <laughs> and that's yeah. why they write, you know. Um, I sort of push them to the side. But um, what you'll find is, at least for how I, I approach it, is, is making sure everybody understand why they're here, <coughs> what path they're on. Um, many times like when you go to a clinic or hospital, the most important part of the examination is the oral examination. Yes. When someone comes to me and they, have, they bring their work, I don't look at their work. I just listen to them to get a sense of who they are as human beings, what, how writing is important to them, what their stories are. And there are some people I can't help and I don't want to help um, because there's certain things I feel, well, they're not healthy. Um, or for example, maybe they need to go see a specialist. Uh, I can, nothing I can do with that. Um, and so for me, when I find the individuals, and I can go down the list of people that I saw and I, I just look at where they are now, uh, I'm really impressed by, by their, the path they've taken, um, their, how their careers have developed. And that's when you know that somebody's here, not just to write poetry, not just to write a novel, but here to give us as human beings some sort of gift that is going to change our lives. But you know, not everybody knows that at different times of their lives. I that's mean, why I, we have teachers and mentors. That's why we have teachers and mentors. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, I didn't write my book until I was well out of school, and I didn't even know I was a writer. Uh, and then one day, I just started to do it, and I didn't even know I was a writer. Is that a common? No, it goes back to what I was saying about when you go to the clinical hospital, many people don't know why they're sick. They know something's bothering them. You may have a story inside of you, but it's getting it out, and so it may take a number of years before the medication works, <laughs> okay? But then, at the end, you're well, and we're happy we have something to read. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, speaking of reading, um, Ethelbert, you're a uh, poet. Would you mind saying about something about, you know, where are the love poems for dictators? I tell you what was very interesting. Um, the poet Brian Gilmore um, wrote an article after Gaddafi was removed from power. And he began with my poem, which is from a number of years ago. He began, like, where are the love poems for dictators? And it was very interesting to see how a poem I'd written about Central and South America had survived all these years, and here could be a reader using it to explain what had happened in the Middle East. When I saw that, I said, wow, you know, um, I'm very happy that I've always considered myself a political writer, because you never know how the, f the politics of the future might need your work. And here was somebody finding a poem that I'd written and using it to uh, begin their essay about what was going on in the Middle East. And so I, I was very happy to see that. Are there instances when you have intentionally written something in the hopes that maybe it'll be picked up in the future? All the time. <laughs> Better than think about the past. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, that's how I approach things in terms of, of um, I don't simply write about myself. Uh, I think I spend a lot of time now writing love poems uh, because I feel that's what's needed in the world. Um, so I try to, to, to try to change the agenda. I'm very much aware of the society I live in. I'm very much aware of how um, the media operates. And so when I interact with it, even if it's a poem, I'm very much aware of how my work is going to be picked up and used. And Mary, you're, uh, do you have the similar views about your poetry as well? Well, I was thinking as, as Ethelbert was talking, um, I, I wrote a poem about the Chilean miners. Um, it's an ode to the, to the miners. Um, and normally my poetry is rather internal, except for a 20-year commitment of my life to Lithuania, and, and that's another story, um, which has to do with looking at trauma and, and so on. But um, it, with the, the, the poem for the Chilean miners was a, a, an ode to bless them, essentially, and to bless the, and I don't mean that in a religious sense, really, but to bless the, the constructive coming together of many countries and huge efforts that allowed them to live and, and, to, to, and, and their own remarkable efforts at, at seeing that they could live as long as they were able to. I, th I thought it was a stunning example of something we seem to forget all the time about, about how to, to really help one another and not to hurt one another. Uh, so, and that, that poem, I would say, was much more outward in, in a sense. It was much more of, of the world. 
But let's assume that somebody watching this today is a college student, a, a recent college student, and didn't really follow the news and didn't really know about the Chilean miners and the whole saga. How do you think that poem would affect that student? Well, I guess I would hope that um, it offers a, a, a tiny route towards constructive behavior, towards, towards loving behavior, um, just that. And maybe there's, I hope there's enough in the poem, it's rather a long poem, um, that, that there could be just an inkling of this might be a way to behave, this might be a better way to behave. But let's take this a step farther, and, and, yeah. and, I, and I, I like your answer, and I think yeah. it's an important answer, but let's say I'm a computer science major. I'm an engineer. I'm a recent college student. I didn't know anything about the minors. How would I know about your class, your poem, and what would push me to, to, to learn about it? Well, maybe the poem wouldn't, but if you were an engineer, you'd be fascinated. I just heard a talk by the engineers who, who saved these, who, who built these and constructed these, these huge um, apparatus. Um, so maybe, maybe you wouldn't, but reading it, you might be tempted to think, how did they get them out? How, what kind of material did they use? How did they get these 50-ton equipment into, into this tiny place in Chile? Yeah. And how would you say the state of poetry is? Uh, it's now 2012 that we're taping the show. Uh, what is the state of poetry? Well, you know, when the president speaks in January, he always says, the State of the Union is good, <laughs> regardless <laughs> of whether there's wars going on or whatever. And so I would respond by saying, the state of American poetry is good. Uh, I, I, I think there is some things to be concerned about. I think right now we have a fascination with spoken word. Uh, I believe there is a difference, there's connections, but uh, there, there is a, a, a tremendous interest in spoken word. Uh, right now within the African American community, I think organizations like Kavi Khanum, uh, which is a special writer's workshop that's held every year, that is transforming uh, African American literature and transforming the American um, landscape. I think what you'll see in the future is the next, say, 10, 15 years, and you've seen this started already, whenever you see any of the major book awards for poetry, you will probably see one or two African American poets nominated. Almost all of them will always have a connection to Kavi Khanum. And you can go back the last few years and see that. I think that's an indication of what can happen when people create structures to help people who want to write. I know there's many people, for example, interested in writing. Where do I go? Who can teach me? And I think Kavi Khanum was very helpful because there were a generation of writers who would go to MFA programs and would be culturally isolated. They'd be the only black person in the room uh, at some of these residencies. And, and they felt they were just isolated. Uh, when I saw the first group of writers come back from Kavi Khanum, it's as if they were like, you know, they went up to the, and like Moses and got some tablets. It was a burning bush there. Oh, there's God, and you know, there's other people who write, you know. And, and they came back down and they didn't, you know, throw the tablets down. They began to spread the faith like you're supposed to. And, and I think that that enthusiasm, uh, in terms of looking at that generation of African American writers, uh, was really hope for the future. And now here it is in, in 2012, and you can just go down the list of these individuals who came out of Kavi Khan and are winning all the awards. And I would add to that, um, if you look at the Associated Writing Programs Conference that just took place in Chicago, 10,000 people showed up, 10,000 poets and writers. Um, also, I would mention Furious Flower Poetry Center that I've just I've joined their board recently. Um, they, they, their whole purpose is African American poetry, a, an astonishing group, and they work with young kids in camps, with college students, with older adults, and, and it's a joyful, terrific group. How about using what you're talking about in terms of helping to heal beyond just the, uh, the veterans? How does, how does this work in terms of healing internally? Well, for me, I, uh, along with the veterans, I, being a literary activist, I try to make sure I'm taking poetry into the jails, uh, I'm taking poetry into senior citizen homes. Uh, when you go into those communities, you realize exactly how powerful the word is, you know, um, dealing with people who are just learning how to read again, or uh, in terms of reading critically, uh, people who now have time to write. Uh, or, or people who are at the particular point in their life where they, they want to preserve memories, and, and poetry is a way of doing that. And so in that case, you begin to see the, the human spirit going through a, a sort of healing process, and I think that's good. Well, we only have a minute or two left, so if I could ask both of you, what advice would you have for 
either the college student who's thinking about studying uh, the humanities or the mom or dad who's wondering, well, why are we talking about this when my student needs to get a job? What would be the two things that you would leave them with, the one or two things you would leave them with? Well, one thing I would leave people with is, because we're in a market economy, I would encourage all young people to buy a book of poetry. And your poetry. <laughs> <laughs> you can begin with that. I'm in the middle of the alphabet. <laughs> I, I would say, um, well, the MCAT exam for medical school, half of that exam is verbal. So if you're going to, no matter what you're going to do, if it's law or medicine or anything, uh, you, you need to know how to read and to think. Um, um, um. But one last thing, in terms of thinking, I mean, what we, do, what we want to do is, of course, encourage students in terms of the liberal arts. We want to encourage students to be great thinkers. But I guess the question that I would love to leave viewers with is the difference between majoring in a humanities-based field and taking some humanities courses. Well, I think education is changing. I think that, you know, the way the world is, it doesn't matter what you major or minor in. I think it's whether you can come out of an institution and know how to make decisions, whether you know how to, how to deal with the, 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 dealing with the common good, whether you're a person of service. I think those are the things that you want to come out of college with. I think the ability to tie your shoe or put on your shirt comes second, but are you a good person is first. And also to follow what you are drawn to. Nothing is wasted in education, nothing. It comes to, to bear later in your life in ways you couldn't imagine. So, so I would say if, if humanities is what attracts you to do it, and take some other courses as well. Well, thank you both for sharing your thoughts today. Thank you. Thank you. If you would like additional information about Myra Scleru or Ethelbert Miller, please visit American.edu or eethelbertmiller.com. If you have comments or suggestions about higher education today, please send an email to our viewer mailbox at highereducationtoday at topcolleges.com. Thank you for watching. We will continue to bring you quality discussions about important matters in today's college and university world. Please join me again for another edition of Higher Education Today. I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, and you've been watching Higher Education Today.